Hey. <laughs> Next up. Sorry for my squeaky chair. I don't know why this chair so squeaky. But, um... Next up, we got the case of Cole, Kyle, dot Russell Williams. All right, um, JCS inspired. You know, what I'm saying, wait on JCS to post. All right, JCS ain't post since 1985. You know, what I'm saying, I'm growing gray hairs. JCS, I'm growing gray hairs. Please post a video. Anyways, um, y'all comment any other um, uh, these like crazy, you know, what I'm saying interrogation uh videos. Um, shout out to the person that uh. I think her name is Suzanne. I don't want to mess your name up. Hold on. Wait. Let me get in one second. Um, but yeah, you've been going back and uh commenting on all my videos, my old videos I made. Thank you for that. You know what I'm saying? I'll definitely be seeing your comments. <clears throat> but yeah, Suzanne. Thank you. She requested this video. You know what I'm saying? So, A. We here, crazy guy. Y'all kind, y'all comment any more uh, crazy cases? I miss doing these videos. JCS ain't posted, so hey, if y'all and if y'all like these videos, uh, y'all gonna like the um the ones I do on Mr. Ballin. Uh, he do crazy uh scary stories too, so y'all check those out too. But hey, man, hour long video. I don't know if I'm gonna do two parts or one. We're gonna just see if it's interesting. You gonna watch the whole thing right now? If it's not, two parts. But hey, man, let's see what it is. Time, I ain't seen this in 1985, man. Terrifying. What makes the case of Russell Williams fascinating yet terrifying is that for all of his bizarre, fetish behavior, he wasn't a psychopath. In fact, he's something more horrifying. Williams was a man of hope. Mother... Whoa. 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 What is wrong with you, bro? <laughs> bro, what is wrong with you? Overwhelming sexual deviance combined with a lack of empathy for victims. But he was able to control his urges in order to avoid detection. Psychopaths are usually easier for police to catch due to their lack of self-control and consistency. But because of his extensive training in the military, Williams was able to exercise judgment and discretion when necessary. In October of 2009, Russell Williams was a 46-year-old commander of the largest and highest functioning Air Force base in Canada. He had been described as an elite pilot over the course of his 23-year career. He had flown Queen Elizabeth, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Governor General of Canada, the Prime Minister of Canada, and many other dignitaries in the Canadian Forces VIP aircraft. He seemed to be the perfect example of a military leader, but something sinister and deadly was lurking deep within him. In October of 2010, he pleaded guilty to two counts of first degree murder, two counts of sexual assault and confinement, and 82 other counts of break and enter and theft. When that news came out, it made the headlines across Canada and around the world for months. A man that Canada had placed in a senior position of trust and authority turned out to have a dark secret life as a deviant killer. As more evidence was revealed, the whole country was shocked, not only by the heinous crimes and the bizarre fetish behavior, but that it was done by someone so highly respected in the military. Russell Williams began breaking into homes in Tweed a town of 1,800 people, about 50 kilometers north of Belleville. The first victims were a family that lived just a few doors down from the cottage Williams owned with his wife on Cozy Cove Lane. The family was friendly with the Williams family, enough to have them over for dinner and to go fishing together on Stocko Lake. Williams would repay their friendship by breaking into their house three times. Three Williams times? took a photo of himself lying naked on the bed masturbating with underwear believed to have belonged to their neighbor's 12-year-old daughter. 14 of the photos he took that night showed him with his penis protruding from the stolen underwear. There were photos of him lying in beds, surrounded by the stuffed toys and panties of little girls, or of him wearing negligees and camisoles. 
Between September 2007 and November 2009, Williams would commit a total of 82 break-ins of 48 homes between Tweed and Ottawa. The majority of the break-ins were undetected and went unreported to police. By September, Williams told police that he needed more stimulation, more risk. Russell Williams committed his first murder on November 16, 2009, when he broke into the home of Corporal Marie France Comu, a military flight attendant who worked at the same military base as Williams. He broke into her house, took some pictures of himself in her underwear, then left. He returned eight days later. Bro, what is up? What is up with you on wearing women's like? You know, what I already think it is though. I think it's because. Uh, you know, because some people, they would go to the uh, military or whatever, and you know what I'm saying? And thank you for your, uh, um, that's what I'm looking for, your uh, commission. No, not the word. Um, your duty. I don't know. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? But when people go to the military, they usually be fucked up in the head because, you know, they see death or, you know what I'm saying, best friend might get killed. So they just seen so much shit. And people say all the time they come back, they be just fucked up when they come back. You know what I'm saying? They can't they can't function in real life no more because, you know what I'm saying, it's been through so much. So I don't know if it's a, it's a couple, it's a mix of that and just weirdness you got going on, but... After hiding in her basement for half an hour... What? Williams attacked Comey with a flashlight, tied her up covered her mouth with duct tape, took some photos, and dragged her up to the bedroom. He then set up a video camera and raped her repeatedly. She continued to struggle against him and begged him to leave and spare her life. He told her to shut up, put duct tape over her nose, and she suffocated to death. Williams yeah. then cleaned up and then drove to Ottawa for a meeting. The murder of the 38-year-old Camus must have temporarily satisfied something because Williams didn't strike again for nearly two months. On January 27th, 2010, he drove past the home of 27-year-old Jessica Lloyd and she was working out on a treadmill. Ah, again, damn. he beat and bound her, put duct tape over her eyes and set up the video and camera. He then raped her repeatedly for hours, pausing to take photos. At around 8 p.m., almost 20 hours after he first attacked her, he told her he would take her home, but as they were leaving, he struck her on the head and strangled her to death. He wrapped her body in a blanket and left it in the garage. Williams drove to the base that evening, flew the following day, and spent the rest of the weekend at his home in Ottawa with his wife. He has a wife. He returned to Tweed he has a wife. on Tuesday and disposed of the body in a wooded area not far from his home sometime around midnight. The police identified distinctive tyre tracks left in the snow near Lloyd's home. They also found traces of boot marks from that location to Jessica's house. One week after her disappearance, the Ontario Provincial Police conducted an extensive canvassing of all motor vehicles using the highway near Lloyd's home looking for the unusual tyre treads. Williams was stopped and an officer noted that his tyre treads resembled those left near Lloyd's home. Unknown to Williams at the time, he was immediately placed under police surveillance. On February 7th, 2010, Williams was asked to be present at the Ottawa Police Service headquarters. Even 10 years after the interrogation took place at the Ottawa Police headquarters, the Russell Williams interrogation video I bet. still packs a massive punch. It captures a vividly emotional and intellectual game of cat and mouse between a seasoned investigator and a powerful yet terrifying man who is slowly realising that his game is up and there is no room for maneuver but before we begin if you like the video please hit the like button and subscribe it would help the channel a lot and i'd really appreciate it and tell me the punishment you think he should get in the comment section below without further ado let's start the interrogation video death penalty <clears throat> detective jim smith starts off the interview by making small talk to build rapport with williams Remember that idiom you probably heard as a child? You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. There is a reason why people have been saying this for generations, and this has become a common technique used by police to establish a higher level of trust with the suspect. Provoking the subject simply doesn't win them over to your side. Williams is not going to share his deepest and darkest secrets to someone who doesn't understand him or even like him. 
Have you ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? I have never been interviewed by the police. Oh, no? Okay. No. Okay. No. You'll come to notice that Russell smiled to the camera, thinking it's just going to be a quick, casual chat, and the police will continue to suspect his neighbour of the crime. He is also probably thinking that after the chat, he's going to go home and have dinner with his wife. Williams probably didn't know much about the soft-spoken man sitting opposite him. Detective Sergeant Jim Smith was a veteran in the OPP Behavioural Sciences Unit and an expert in criminal profiling and forensic psychiatry. Before the interview, he had already sat down with his team with a body of evidence and developed a profile of who Russell Williams is and what he's most likely to do when he's asked certain questions. It was all calculated and tactically planned way before he walked into the room. That's, that's what I be saying. The police is 20,000 steps ahead, bro. A million steps ahead, bro. A million. I like how you got this little meter. <laughs> Relaxed, concerned, agitated. Oh, shit. The fuck my life. I like that. I want to see where he gets to agitated. I want to see what that far, how far it gets him. How far it takes to get him like that. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, and investigating. Top like secret this. and clear. What does that mean? It's complete news, uh, yeah. especially down uh, Belleville Way. Um, and, you know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm -hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So, um, because of that, we're treating uh, just <coughs> this case uh, as an emergent situation, obviously. Um, so, we're, we're fast forwarding things that we might normally take our time with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why. We're here on a Sunday afternoon, sure. so uh, again, I appreciate it. No um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today. Okay, okay. Um, the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things, and uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you. Okay, okay. Um, I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a, a coffee guy or something. I, I didn't want to drink in front of you, so no, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. You'll notice here that Detective Jim continues to build rapport to establish trust by offering him a cup of coffee. They also probably found out how he takes his coffee, and there are several specific reasons why he does this. First, it removes any tension, makes the situation more comfortable, just like when you're sitting down with a friend sipping a cup of coffee for a casual chat. Second, caffeine will make a suspect more anxious, which will make him likely to talk. Mm. A cup of coffee is an unexpected gift. That will make Williams feel like he owes something back. And fourth, police usually offer suspects coffee to protect them from claims later on that they were mistreating the subjects. I could uh, definitely, are they black? Yeah, they're just black with, uh, with sugar. Um, sorry, what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. Piece of gum. <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. All right, and again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Um, but again, uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I treat everybody with respect. I don't ask you to do the same for me. The detective then asks Williams, treat him with respect. You'll notice that he didn't ask Williams to be truthful, but respectful, because that would have come across as being accusatory if Williams was being called a liar even before the questioning begins. This is a common technique that allows the police to later confront the suspect that he's breaking his promise when he does actually lie. It will later make Williams feel like a disgraceful person for breaking his promise to the nice man who offered him a cup of coffee. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are, okay? okay? Just like everybody else, okay? okay. Um, have you ever been read your rights before? No. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it on TV a whole bunch of times, right. but that's usually the American version, so okay. I'll go over with you briefly, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, basically in Canada, uh, as you know, I'm sure, is uh, we all have uh, our rights guaranteed under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Right. Okay. Now, uh, Russell, just to avoid any confusion, because people do get confused when they're talked to by the police, is mm -hmm. that uh, um, you're obviously not under arrest here today. Okay. Yeah. Anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Teresa will walk you down the lobby anytime you want. Okay. Mm -hmm. In every interrogation, it is required for the detective to tell the suspect of his rights which means that he actually does not have to say anything. Detective Jim also added that Williams can just walk out freely out of the room if he wants to and have dinner with his wife. This was purposely done to further establish comfort and trust with Williams. However, if Williams were to leave the room, the detective could easily get a warrant for his arrest and he'll be back in that seat the following day. Uh, <laughs> if there's anything that comes up in our interview today, Russell, that uh, 
that you feel you want to talk uh, to a lawyer about, um, you just uh, you just let me know, okay? And the reason for that is I want to explain to you exactly what's going on here, okay? Um, uh, Jessica uh, Lloyd is um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating, mm -hmm. right? Um, and essentially, what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months, um, there have been four occurrences that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm -hmm. uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009. Yeah. Um, and very briefly, they were up in the, uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm -hmm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing uh, sexual acts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, yeah. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie-France uh, Como um, yeah. Yeah, was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And uh, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. And um, then, most recently, we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so essentially, when you look at those kind of crimes, we're looking at a number of different uh, potential criminal charges. All right, um, we're looking at issues uh, all the way from the most serious one, which is first degree murder, mm -hmm. uh, kidnapping, uh, sexual assault, mm -hmm. uh, break and enter with intent to commit sexual assault, yeah. uh, forcible confinement. Okay. And uh, so what I want to make sure you understand, and this is what we've been doing with everybody we've been talking to, is that clearly when we find out who's responsible for one or all of those crimes, yeah. uh, they could be charged with one or all of those offenses, okay? Whether it's you or whether it's anybody else, all right? Absolutely. And that's why it's important that we uh, make sure that people understand what they have to do and what they don't have to do when they're talking to us, mm -hmm. okay? So as I said before, any point today uh, you feel the need, you want to speak to a lawyer, uh, you let me know, and uh, we can take you to a room where you can do that in private, okay? Um, do you have your own lawyer? I have a realty lawyer, but okay. you know I don't have a lawyer. <laughs> All right. Um, if at any point you want to make that call and you don't know who to call, mm -hmm. uh, we have a phone list of lawyers that uh, are available to give you advice free of charge right over the phone. Okay. okay? So again, if at any point today you want to uh, take advantage of that, you just let me know. Sure. Um, is there any reason you want to call a lawyer now? No. Okay. A um, couple other uh, fairly simple and straightforward uh, things that uh, you probably understand, but uh, again, we go over them to make sure everybody's clear, mm -hmm. is that uh, you don't have to speak to me today, okay? okay? And the reason for that is because the law considers me to be what we refer to as a person in authority, mm -hmm. okay? Probably similar to what you may be considered to be on the base. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I can be compelled to appear before any judge in the country, basically, to account for what takes place here today between you and I, okay? Sure. And that's the reason why everything's recorded, yeah, um, because there can't be any more accurate record than that, right? So, no, understood. Um, and the other thing I want to make sure you understand is that uh, you know you mentioned a second ago about uh, Miss Como um, being one of your uh, work associates. Um, so I don't know what's happened since November um, on the military side of things, um, but what we want to make people clear on is that uh, if you have been spoken to by any person in authority or any police officer about any of those cases. Um, I don't want what they may have said to you to uh, um, make you feel influenced or compelled to say anything to me today, okay? Whatever you might have felt influenced or compelled to say to them earlier, mm -hmm. you don't have to repeat it to me and you don't have to say anything further, okay? Yeah. But obviously what you do say, you know, for the third time is being yeah. recorded, right? So, um, Understood. These first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Tweed. Well, the second one did. Yeah. We didn't even know the first one had happened, but uh, I understand that was reasonably close as well, but the second one was very close. Yeah. So certainly at the time, the OPP did a, uh, a door to door. And yeah. Within, uh, within a couple of days, probably the same night, so it's about right about that time. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm aware of that from uh, looking at the different cases. And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to, uh, to talk to you about. Okay. Um, those four cases are a lot of concern to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of. Uh, make us want to talk to, to Russell Williams, okay? Because mm -hmm. um, essentially, uh, there's a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Mm. Would you agree? Geographically, yeah, I guess or... I drive past, uh, yes, I, I would yeah. have to say there's a, a connection there. Russell went on to proactively talk about the case, and Jim quickly took the opportunity and tried to blame Russell that he had a connection with the four cases mentioned. A completely normal and innocent person would have been offended and furious to be accused of having such a connection, but he was not offended. 
Because he actually did these crimes. <laughs> he did. Like, um, oh, God, no. Like, Why he just say, yeah, I think I do have a grenade? She's like, what? <laughs> You're so dumb. Oh, my God. <laughs> you already okay, caught. Okay, and I see what the complete is doing, though. You see how he's talking? And then, like, it's kind of hard to explain, though. But it's kind of like he's saying shit. He's like, yeah. No, 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 no. He's like, yeah. Like, he, he answered just yeah, everything. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like it just... uh. uh I don't know. It's hard to explain, but if you can just tell how they talking to each other, you would tell the police is uh is talking to him in a manner as where he not a threat or anything like he said before, not a threat or nothing like that, and he's just answering yes. You know what I'm He just he just trying to he like going through the conversation, just yeah, okay, uh, no, I want I want to lower or okay, you know what I'm saying? Just like it's hard to explain though. Like y'all got you got to see it. I don't know. Uh, things kind of um. Uh, evolved when uh, it's kind of like that's why he ain't like just like he ain't like think about what he just said like it's connected to you he ain't think about that you know I see just say yeah I think it's connection you know you know what I'm saying just like blatantly just saying yes to everything he's saying you feel me it's kind of a tactic I see on Thursday night okay uh, we kind of went from so he's just saying yes to everything when I think he discussed <clears> the fact that you were a uh, uh, a colonel uh, at the base um, oh, I was in uniform at the time. Yeah, so pretty obvious, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, then the connection with Miss Como um, yeah. was made, um, and I believe you're uh, a door or two down from one of those two uh, incidents. Uh, I think uh, three doors down here. Yeah. Very close to that. Okay. Do you remember what time you left the base that night? Mm, I don't remember anything peculiar, so I would say. Uh, I don't know, probably seven to nine, somewhere in that range. Okay. That's when you, you left? Left the base, yeah. And what, what That's a 45 minute transit. 45 minutes home? Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to walk you through November, but I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind, uh, uh, the day that, uh, that Marie Franz uh, coma. Yeah. Um, do you remember how you found out? I uh, do. Yeah, I was sent an email. Um, well, as soon as the, uh, the ops staff in the base learned, they told me. Okay. So I got an email. I can't remember if it was late at night or in the morning. It was certainly, I saw it, uh, I want to say first thing in the morning because I had just come back from Ottawa. I was in Ottawa for uh, um, a set of meetings on one of the days. I can't remember what, what day of the week we're talking about it, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, obviously when you people gets killed, it, it gets your attention. Absolutely. Corporal Marie France Komu was a military flight attendant, a lower level in the military rankings, while Russell Williams is a colonel much higher in the rankings. Her gruesome death was already made public and everyone at the base was aware of it. Russell even wrote a letter of condolences to his family, but did not attend the funeral. When he was asked questions about Marie France, he downplayed her death and it became the first major red flag to Detective Jim. And how did you know Marie France Komu? I'd only met her once. Um, she was on a crew uh, I was on uh, just after I got to the base. Okay. So, uh, I can't even remember, I think it was a one day trip. Uh, I did a, a number of trips uh, in Canada transporting uh, our um, you know, troops, sort of first leg out of Edmonton. Uh, you know, we tend to hopscotch them across uh, until they get a date or so. And, and I, I can't remember which trip it was, but uh, we did a number of them out to Edmonton just to, to pick up the troops, bring them to Trenton, and then uh, put a fresh crew on, and because uh, we fly them back in the same day, so push on the edge of that, and uh, fresh crew on, and continue on after a couple hours total. Okay. Do you know uh, roughly when that happened? That we were on the same crew? The, the time you met her, the one time there, yeah? It was soon after I got to the base, so uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but I would say in the first couple of months, so August, September. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, you got that email notifying you that something had happened. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any kind of a, a clear recollection as to how your schedule was going that week? Well, I can't remember what, again, what day that uh, the message came in. Just a second. Um, I think quite a bit after her body had been discovered. Okay. So... I think what happened, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. 
So I think, if I remember correctly, the MPs learned late that evening. I can't remember when, obviously, their, their body was discovered. It was probably in the news reports. But, uh, so they learned, and then they passed it to Ops that they needed. So they immediately passed it to me. Okay. The MPs work for the wing operations officer, so they go you know, through their chain of command, and then as soon as the, uh, the duty launch officer had that information, she advised me. Okay. Um, so again, that, that along with, along with some others. Right, right. I'm sure it spread like wildfire. Yeah, yeah, um, so that particular week, uh, do you have any recollection? Well, for instance, when you got the email, uh, yeah. do you remember where you were? I was at home in Tweet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you remember if that was a week that you were um, reasonably stable in Trenton, or had you flown? No, I had been in Ottawa. I had been in Ottawa early in the week. Uh, for some meetings over in, uh, in Gatineau for one of the, uh, it's actually for the C-17 acquisition. I was project director and I was here in Ottawa for that, so just some follow-up stuff for that. Okay. So if we were to, uh, to you know, do a, a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there, is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams uh, Absolutely. did this? No. Okay. It would be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right, because essentially that's what I'm looking at. Is it? Uh, um, you, you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in an investigation, right? Okay. Um, so the next thing we need to cover off is. Uh, well, I'll just ask you this straight out. Uh, given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to? Uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch, uh, I prefer Law and Order, but I do watch CSI occasionally, yeah. Okay, so you have an idea of obviously the forensic capabilities, things like mm -hmm. that are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation? What, uh, what do you mean? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions? Yeah. Okay. All right. You'll notice that Detective Jim asked for footwear impressions last. This was purposely done so after he got the first two yeses out of Russell, he's more likely to get a yes out of the third one, which was the most important one. A brilliant tactic by the detective. What Williams didn't know is that the police already had his footprints in the snow at one of his victims' houses and they were hoping that he was stupid enough to wear the same boots he wore to commit the crime to the police station. Um, I think that's what we're going we're gonna to ask you to do. Okay. All right. Now, we have a process we have to go through to do that. Okay. Um, and for the blood sample, uh, I don't take the blood sample. We have specially trained officers that are trained to do that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to step out and make sure they're still available. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? It's possible, yeah. Because uh, you know, this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Well, uh, bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, the military would certainly be a great assistance for, to us, especially mm -hmm. in relation to Miss Como's investigation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's certainly one of the things that went into our decision to to give you a call at home today and see if we could deal with this today. Okay. So, okay. Um, Now that you've had some time to, I mean, I know we've been throwing a lot of things at you here, but now you've had some time to, to think about things. Um, is there anything uh, that you're concerned about uh, that buckle swab matching in any of those four residences? Um, is there, I guess, let me explain you what I'm getting at here, Russell, okay? Um, this is a significant investigation, as you can, yep, as you can well imagine. Yep. Um, that, uh, that DNA is going to be uh, significant in our investigation, both, uh, you know, quite possibly to help you, quite possibly to help us. Understood. I don't know yet. I don't know what the result is yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go back to the example I gave you because it's a very similar uh, issue, I think. Um, and you talked about the idea of discretion here. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the idea that uh, um, 
you know, I think hopefully you appreciate the fact of how we approached you here. Yeah, um, And essentially, uh, we have no issues with that. Okay. Um, we, we talked recently about, you know, the whole idea of any unusual sex acts in your history. Mm-hmm. Um, but another thing that can often happen in cases like this is that people um, become concerned about uh, um, things like extramarital affairs, mm-hmm. uh, indiscretions along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any contact that you may have had with any of those four women um, that you may not want your wife to be aware of? Anything like that that we should know about to try and uh, explain why, if if your DNA is found, it would help us understand why it may be there. Absolutely not. After two and a half hours spent sitting across the same table, Smith found the Colonel's weak spot, the gold wedding ring on his finger. At this point, Williams is nodding his head up and down when Jim is throwing out all these ridiculous facts at him about extramarital affairs. We can all see that Russell gave away a massive nervous body language, and for the first time, he looks insulted. He took a deep breath, shifted in his chair, then denied the allegation by recrossing his arms. Can you think of any reason um, why we would find your DNA in any other businesses? Let's, let's focus on, well, for instance, uh, oops, I believe, let me just check the name there, make sure I've got the right address. Talking about the house that was just uh, a couple of doors down from you there, in, uh, in Tweed. A couple um, of doors down was yeah. Lori, I don't know her last name, I don't know. Mazzucati? I don't even know what her last name is, but... Uh, there's a, the, the woman down the road, three doors down, was, yeah. her name is Lori, I don't know her last name. Right. Let me just make sure we're on the same page here. How you already agitated she, now? She lived at 76 Cozy Cove. Yeah, so she would be the one, the second one. Do I uh, The second incident on your on your road there. Yep. A couple of doors down. Ever been in her house? No. We met her once, I think the first summer uh, we were there, so in 04. Okay. And that's what I'm getting at. I, I, again, this is a credibility issue, right? Yeah. Because I don't want to come and see you two weeks from now and say, you know, arrest uh, yeah. our CSI people in that house. And uh, are you familiar with how C- uh, DNA works? I think broadly, yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, one of the challenges we have in 2010 with DNA is it's become so uh, precise that uh, I guess the best way to explain it is I can think back 15 years ago when I started in. Uh, in violent crime investigation, yeah. um, for us to get a DNA match, the sample we had to find was, um, you know, probably would have filled half of one of these cups, mm-hmm. you know, because they destroy so much of the uh, the sample in the in the testing. Okay. Um, essentially, DNA has become more and more precise to the point where, when you and I walked in this room earlier today, mm-hmm. uh, we could have sat down, talked for thirty seconds, yeah. walked out. CSI officer could have come in three, four days from now, yeah. did some swabs here, and he would have found your DNA and my DNA, mm-hmm. and probably a lot of other people's DNA. Sure. Um, a little bit gross to think about, but essentially, uh, you know, as we talk, um, we, you know, a little bit of aspirate comes out of our mouth yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that contains our DNA, our blood, or uh, our skin cells contain our DNA. Yeah. And that's what I'm getting at. If you were ever in Lori's residence, uh, quite possibly, quite innocently, your DNA could be uh, in that residence. Has there ever been a time you've been in there? Detective Smith is informing Williams that DNA testing doesn't require a blood spatter anymore. Previously, a blood stain, for example, would have to be at least the size of a dime or quarter to elicit enough DNA for a profile. Today, investigators can often retrieve DNA from minute numbers of skin cells, hair, or fingerprints left behind by a criminal. Williams is realizing now that he's beginning to get caught. The police already have his DNA sample, and they will eventually find his DNA in every one of the victim's houses he claimed he was never in. Um. What about the other lady down the road? On uh, I hadn't even heard that name, so no, I don't. I don't actually know who that was. Okay. Have you ever v- visited uh, um, Marie France Como at her residence? No. Okay. All right. Um, so you're quite positive there'd be no reason why your DNA would be in any of those three locations. Okay. Um, did you know Jessica Lloyd even in passing for any reason? No, I didn't hear hear her name, so it was on the news. Okay. And the reason I'm asking that. Uh, is because um, I know you were asked that question on Thursday night. 
And sometimes what we find, and again, this is one of those situations that can sometimes cause us to get in a lengthy investigation in somebody that maybe doesn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what can happen sometimes is they, you know, somebody gets stopped by the police like you did, and they, uh, they get asked that question. And people, when they're stopped by the police, they can be nervous, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so they blurt out an answer, and then they start driving away, and they go, why did I do that? Because the problem is, is that once they uh, get asked again, then they feel compelled to maintain that answer for fear that if they change their answer, yeah. somebody could find it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Okay. So I want to make sure that's not happening here. I don't care what you said to the officers on Thursday night mm -hmm. last week. Um, if there's any uh, communication or contact between you and Jessica Lloyd, you've seen her picture, right? Around town? Yeah, that's okay. right. Cool. Ever seen her before? I don't know. No, I haven't seen her. Okay. All right. All right. What kind of tires do you have on your Pathfinder? I think, um, I think they're Toyo. Okay. Do you know the brand name or, sorry, the uh, name? Sorry, the, the make is Toyo. Yeah. I don't know the model. Okay. I'm going to read this off to you to see if it rings a bell. Ever heard of, uh, does Toyo Open Country HTS? That sounds Make right. any sense? Yeah. Okay. When did you have those tires put on your Pathfinder? Well, it's the second version we've had of them, so... It might have been this past fall. They replaced other ones we had on the same. Okay. Well, Toyo, I can't say that they're the same, exactly the same model, but uh, our dealership here in Ottawa said they were very popular for the Pathfinder. So okay. they were good. They lasted a long time. All right. Um, <laughs> Great detail. Kiss my wife goodbye and headed back to Tweet to go to work the next day. Okay. Um, all right. The uh, the tires that you have on your truck, right? The reason I asked you about that is it is there any time? I mean, uh, you recall uh, where you were stopped um, by the officers there? Yes. Okay. Did they explain to you what the significance so that was? Your house? House? That was your house. Yeah. Right. So you remember that location? Yep. Do you remember what the crossroad was or? I don't think there's a crossroad, it's sort of just uh, a set of end of 37. Okay. Um, when you get stopped at that location, has there been a time in the recent uh, one or two weeks that uh, your vehicle has uh, left that road for any reason whatsoever? Have you driven into a field with your vehicle at all? Um, for any reason you can think of? No. Okay. Because um, I want you to rack your brain here, this is important. So yeah, yeah. Is there anything you can remember doing that? Uh, you know, would have caused you to, to uh, drive off the road. No, I'm at the, uh, I'm going to switch my camera. Hold on. I, I want y'all to see the other side. I don't know if I'm blocking it or not. No, that's my early, uh, that's the early part of the highway, and I'm just head north. It's about 30 minutes from there to, uh, uh, probably 20 from there to my house. Okay. Um... Would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property, uh, that they identified um, a set of tire tracks uh, to the north of her property? Um, looks as if the vehicle left the road mm -hmm. and uh, drove along the north tree line of, of uh, Jessica Lloyd's property. Okay. Yeah. Um, they took, uh, they, they examined those tire tracks mm -hmm. and uh, they have contacts in the tire business, obviously mm -hmm. tire tracks are a major source of uh, evidence for us. Sure. Um, shortly after um, this investigation started, they identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah. Oh, they, shit. <laughs> one of the other oh, uh, shit. <laughs> things that they do to try and identify the type of vehicle that may have left those tires, mm -hmm. well, is they do two things. They, they talk to witnesses, mm -hmm. okay? Um, there was a, uh, a female police officer that actually drove by that location uh, that evening mm -hmm. and recalls seeing an SUV type vehicle in the field up to the north of Jessica Lloyd's house, uh, consistent with a, a Pathfinder. Okay. Yeah. Maybe consistent with other things, but consistent yeah. with a Pathfinder. Uh, and I'm s 
I could just literally see his face. He's turning red. He's turning red. He's turning red, bro. Mm -hmm. Uh Oh, uh, here we go. What they also do to try and identify the type of the vehicle is they look at uh, what they call the wheelbase width, Mm -hmm. okay? Because different vehicles, different makes, models have wheelbase width. So they can take those two sets of tire tracks, measure the distance between them, okay? And determine what the uh, the width is, sure. and then they can enter that into a vehicle database, and it will spit out the types of vehicles. Okay, okay? Um, your Pathfinder's uh, wheelbase width is very very close to the width of the uh, of the tires uh, uh, that were left in that field. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, do you have any recollection at all of being off that road? No, it's not off the road. Okay. When Detective Jim asked Williams if he remembered going off that road. A normal, innocent person would have been appalled by the attempted accusation. But he's got his arms folded, and he's nodding. His body language is showing, yes, I was there. And what he's saying is not convincing either. His heart is probably beating off his chest inside while thinking, what did I do? Where did I drive? He's trying to retrace his steps back, trying to be ahead of the investigator. But that does not seem to work. His entire body language is showing that he's in serious trouble. All right. Russell. Um, is there anything you can think of, let's go talk about Marie France Como for a minute, okay? Mm-hmm. Is there any reason at all you can think of that during our investigation, obviously we're searching uh, computers, uh, uh, things like Blackberries, right? Mm-hmm. Electronic devices, uh, looking through houses for things that are in handwriting, written notes, diaries, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'm not at liberty to tell you what the content was, but is there any reason at all you can think of why Marie France Como would have specifically referenced you in some of her, uh, in some of her writings? Not at all. No? No, absolutely not. Okay. Is there anything that she ever said to you that led you to believe that there might be something uh, more than a passing interest with her towards you? Not at all. No, we spent, you know, one fight. Together talking, I'd go back occasionally and talk. No, I, I, if that's the case, that's a, that's very surprising. Okay, all right. Um, you have any questions for me right now? No. Okay. I'm just going to step out and see how things are going. Okay. okay. I mean, it is a Sunday, but there's probably 60, 70 people working on this file, so there's a lot of things happening. Sure. Uh, so let me go out and see what's happening, and then I'll uh, I'll come back in and uh, we'll hopefully continue. Okay. okay. I told you when I came in here uh, that I now treat you with respect and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here, okay? Uh, the, the trying to be as discreet as possible, mm-hmm. okay? But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? One of the most fascinating parts of this interrogation is when Detective Jim Smith re-enters the room and makes the transition from good cop to bad cop. Smith executed this technique in a near perfect manner. You'll notice that the detective entered the room and quickly states his disappointment while speaking to Russell, but not looking at him. But was he really disappointed in Russell? No, that was part of the plan. From the beginning, Jim was playing the nice good cop by treating Williams with respect and deference, but no suspect will confess to a good cop without ever experiencing bad cop. And it's not issues that point away from you. It's issues that point at you, okay? And I want to, I want you to see what I mean, mm-hmm. all right? This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm-hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? All right? Now, I want you to keep in mind that this is slightly smaller, okay, in scale, okay? Okay. All right, that's not to scale. That's The footwear is actually bigger. Okay. If you look here on the ruler, you'll see that uh, one inch is just slightly smaller than an actual inch, okay? okay? But this is the way it prints off on the computer. Okay. I'm going to move this over so you can see what I mean, all right? Because essentially, when you're dealing with footwear impressions, um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world-renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm-hmm. And essentially, with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm-hmm. okay? And essentially, what we're talking about here is, what, especially when you start adding in other pieces of, of uh, information that mm-hmm. uh, support 
uh, an investigative position. Okay. Yeah. This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago. Okay. Now, I'm not an expert on footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like uh, like fingerprint comparisons. Okay. You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. Oh. This person walked oh my through. God. There's several different prints to compare. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get features off of one print to compare, features off of another print to compare. Yeah. These are identical. This nigga. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house. This is called positive confrontation, which is the first step of the Reed Technique method of interrogation. It is when the police begin to present damning evidence to the suspect. You'll notice at this point Williams is nodding his head up and down, which is an involuntary reaction, and it is indicative of what's going on inside of him. It appears that he is shocked that the police have already got his boot prints and quickly realised how careless he was to wear the same boots to the police station. He then clammed up entirely, his body froze, and he went silent for minutes. Detective Jim, a seasoned interrogator, was smart to stay quiet and used that silence to build anxiety in Williams. It feels like there's a clock ticking in his mind, pressuring him to speak. Hey, you want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is, this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. <clears throat> this is getting beyond my control. I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house and I need to know why. He's still nodding his head. Yep, fuck my life meter. I don't know what to say. It's, uh... Well, you need to explain it because... This is the other problem you're having, Russell. Okay. Dang, that's not the okay, only these thing. These are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence in Omaha. Dang. So your wife now knows what's going on. There's a search warrant being executed at the, the residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized. Okay. You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations. You and I both know that the unknown offender, male, male on Marie France Congo's body, is going to be matched to you, quite possibly before the evening's over. Dang. Right. This is a major investigation. The Center of Forensic Sciences on call 24 hours a day helping us with this. Mm -hmm. Are you going to jail? Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm. <laughs> you okay. dial bad, Rob. Sorry. We're applying. The investigators now applying for a warrant to search your office. Oh, shit. Right. These aren't decisions that we can say yes or no to. This is a practical steps mm. in an investigation like this. And Russell... He not even looking at it for real. I bet he not. He just looking. He not even looking at it for real. He just looking at random shit, just, just thinking. Russell, mm -hmm. listen to me for a second, okay? When that evidence comes in, when that DNA <laughs> match, when that phone rings and somebody knocks on this door, mm -hmm. your credibility is gone, okay? Because this is how credibility works. All right. And I know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation, but I also know your mind's racing right now, okay? Because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years, mm -hmm. okay? Murderers usually feel alone and misunderstood after the crime, and what they want the most is to find someone to share about what they did. Detective Jim knows this, and he took advantage of it by saying that he's not alone, and he's someone that will understand Williams. 
This was a brilliant tactic by the detective. The bottom line is, is that as soon as we get that, that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay, as soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're a match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Because as soon as that happens, where's your credibility? Where's your believability? You're just another, uh, and again, don't take this wrong, okay? But you can see if you step outside this room in your mind and imagine how people are going to view you, okay? If the truth comes out after the clear evidence is presented to you, when you finally go, okay, I'm screwed now, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Is he going to confess? Chris, you know there's only one option. What do you, what do you, what other option is there? What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold-blooded psychopath option. Which is, that's what he is, a cold-blooded psychopath. I might be wrong. Because uh, don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it, got off on having that label, Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. You'll notice here that Williams gave a smile and a nod, indicating that he accepted the detective Jim's compliment. But Detective Jim quickly pulled the compliment that Williams just smiled at away from him. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is the pull and push technique of interrogation, where the push is the praise and the pull is taking back that praise in order to get him to chase after what he just lost. This was done to get Williams to try to get back what he just lost by confessing to his crimes. This is over. And it can have a, a bad ending where Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. Detective Jim is now attempting to make it seem like Russell can go from being a villain to being a hero by helping the police to locate the body. But because psychopaths have a fragile self-identity and rely on other people's perception of them, Feeling like the hero who led the police to the missing person is very appetizing to someone like Williams. I mean, obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight, for all I know. They might have already found it. He just said they might have already found it. That would have been perfect. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. What are we going to do? <laughs> no, yeah, he said a word. There are now long periods of silence. Detective Jim used this to his advantage to continue to further build anxiousness in Williams. Yes. Okay. Williams is beginning to realize that he's now caught. In the second stage of the read interrogation technique, the goal is to make the suspect progressively more and more comfortable while acknowledging the truth about what they've done. Williams remains in denial at first, unable to believe the situation he's found himself in. But as soon as he says, call me Russ, Smith knows he has broken through the colonel's thick wall of silence. Is Jessica somewhere we can find her easily? Like, is this something where I can make a call and tell somebody to go to a location and they're going to find her, or is this something where we have to go with? In this past hour of the interrogation, Smith is most urgently interested in finding the body of Jessica Lloyd as soon as possible. Once he has the location of her body, he sends out officers to find it. Then he moves on to talk to Williams about her murder and the other crimes he's suspected of. And just in case he stopped talking and requested to hire a lawyer, they at least have the missing person. 
which would naturally include the evidence to convict Williams. Which direction are we heading in here? Russ, maybe, maybe this would help. Can you tell me what the issue is you're struggling with? Okay, <laughs> don't say a word, issue. bro. He said, call me Russ. It's hard to believe this is not. Oh my god, nigga, you fucking raped and killed little females, bro. Well, not little females, but females. Why is it hard to believe? Took pictures and clothes. Tied them up and... Can't believe this is happening. Wow. Russ, is there anything you want from me? To let me go. Is there anything you want me to explain? Is there something missing that you're struggling with that I can shed some light on for you? struggling with how upset my life is right now. Russ, what are you looking for? I'm concerned that they're tearing apart my wife's brand new house. So am I. What? But if nobody tells them what's there and what's not, they don't have any choice. Computers will be brought to Microsoft in California. They'll be they'll be picked apart. You can't erase things from computers. It doesn't happen. I'm sure you've seen that. I'm sure that's pretty common knowledge these days. It just doesn't happen. There's, they sell programs that uh, to try and help people clean their computers of stuff. And our guys are pulling that stuff out all the time. The FBI is pulling that stuff out all the time. This investigation will end up costing no less than $10 million. Easy. And they will say no to nothing. Any request this major case manager makes on this case, they've already been told it's approved. Don't even bother asking. What am I doing, Russ? I put my best foot forward here for you, but I really have. I don't. I don't know what else to do to, to make make you understand the impact of what's happening here. This nigga dog. I'm oh, amen. I mean, Minimize the impact on my wife. So do I. Oh, you think about his high? Yeah, he think about high so impact. I think about it. Well, we start by telling the truth. I guess that was smart to do. Okay. So where is she? Oh, After four shit. hours and 40 minutes of quiet, oh, intense shit. intellectual combat, Russell Williams has now been broken. Oh. This is the turning point, and there's no turning back. Every detective watching this live feed was probably celebrating because they know they've caught him. <clears throat> Williams has now come to terms that he's now caught, and the awful reality that he'll spend the rest of his life in prison has now sunk in. Um, is she close to where she lives? I've got maps of that general area. I don't got a time machine here. Why don't we start there? I don't got a map, bro. L detective. I'm not sure if he gave me a map of um, that covers Calabar down to the highway. And over to Tweed. And so I'll show you. Let me see what I got here. I might have something. Bro, how Is she you inside, know outside?
probably the biggest area I have there, Chris. So where am I going on the, uh, here to get to her? In this block here. Okay. So you're pointing to a detailed map of that area and I'll show you where she is. Shower some DoorDash. Is she close to a road? Yep. All right. Um, is it something where, is she, is she buried or is she somewhere where if you walk there you would, you would fairly easily see her? It's here. Okay. So she's south of seven. Uh, east of Tweed, mm -hmm. west of 41. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's this road here? Not sure. Neither am I. Okay. I'll be right back, okay? Do you want any water or anything? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These owls are water. How long has she been there for? A little over a week. Was it fairly quick from the time she left? Friday night. Friday night? Yep. So where was she between Thursday night and Friday night? In Tweed. With you? Yep. How long was she alive for? Almost 24 hours, not quite. Okay. Russ? You're doing the right thing here. Okay. This is a very important moment and an excellent strategy by Detective Jim when he offered a handshake to Williams. This was purposely done for three reasons. First, it shows trust and respect that they're going to go through everything that has happened. Second, it encourages Williams to want to speak openly to Jim about everything and it would essentially seal the deal that he would confess tonight. And third, by saying that he's doing the right thing, he's also rewarding Williams so that he continues to speak truthfully and in essence changing his negative identity from doing the wrong things for so long into a positive identity by doing what's right by telling the truth. I'll tell you where the unregistered cards are. Where are they? They're in the house there, but... In Ottawa? Yep. Whereabouts? Um, that boy tell you everything, huh? Some in the camera bag, which they would have found in my office. Mm -hmm. And in the, when you walk into the office on the left side, there's a, um, a desk of uh, drawers, side yeah. drawers, like a filing cabinet, wooden, Ikea. In one of the top two drawers, and there's a plastic divider. Yeah. And there's, uh, inside there, there are two memory cards. Which are blank, but I'm sure they can be really uh, And whose images are on those cards? Uh, well, I've erased them, but I expect. Uh, All right, here we go. Images of uh, just DoorDash. This was a slick move by Detective Jim. Deliberate question, assuming Williams committed that murder too even though he has not confessed to it yet. The detective wanted Williams to confirm all these while he was speaking honestly. Because when someone is speaking honestly and openly, it's difficult for them to suddenly lie. Yeah. There may be images on there as well. And the two women from September? Yep. Okay. Do you have those images stored anywhere else? Yeah, there are um, two hard drives in the house in Ottawa. I can draw you a little picture of that. Sure, do you want to do that now while I'm sure. getting them out? Okay. Want anything to eat or anything? Okay. 
Williams only wants to speak to Jim as he clearly feels respected and understood and even liked by Jim. He's not going to be honest and continue to reveal his deepest and darkest secrets if he suddenly feels that his interrogator hates or disrespects him. Somebody running around looking for an actual map, but uh, they did the same thing with uh, the Google Maps. Just have to loosen up a little bit more. Um, Things they got a map. Y'all are AO detectives. This is the this is the biggest of the area. This might have better parameters for you. There's tweet. But I'm getting deja vu right now, bro. What the? question I'm going to have for you is when they go there and they'll be there shortly they're going to find it oh, yeah. okay I'll be right back. Yeah, what if he is lying about it looks like you want to say something just that the this place my wife it's been a dream for a better part of the year so I'm keen to get them what they need and so they can leave right along okay we'll, we'll do our, do our best to keep that as low key as possible what do you want to talk about? It's, it's uh, pretty wide open now. Eh? Yeah. What do you want to know? Well, do you want to work forwards or backwards? Doesn't matter. Why don't we start with Jessica? Um, I saw her in her house on her trip. I wouldn't say that, I guess. And I noticed she wasn't um, there Thursday. So I got in the house, look around, then, um, and then left. Noticed she'd come home, so I went back in through the uh, back patio door while she was uh, sleeping. So I woke her up, didn't, um, didn't hit her, she only hit her once, Friday night. Well, so I raped her in, uh, in her house. A rape could mean a lot of different things. Uh, what kind of sexual act took place? Vaginal and oral. Oral. Who was performing the oral sex? No, me on her and her on me. Okay. What the fuck? Any, uh, any condoms used or anything like that? No. No. And then I took her to the car and took her to Tweed. Spent the day in Tweed. And I had told her... Um, earlier that before I let her go I wanted to take some pictures of her in her underwear and have sex with her. So after she had uh, a rest for an hour or so, I had her uh, put on a number of different outfits she had. Put on a number of, you know, pairs and his bra that she had. I got taken from that. So she put those on and I took pictures. Mm -hmm. Are you in any of these pictures? Yep. So there's a video of the uh, almost four hours, I guess. So Jessica poses for these pictures, and there's videos, and you know, of the uh, almost four hours, I guess. He says a four hour. So you raped her for four hours. So you raped her for four hours, and you recorded for four hours, bro. So Damn, bro. Jessica poses for these pictures and there's videos and, um, and then what happens? After Russell Williams began confessing, he became very calm and had almost a matter-of-fact way of describing his crimes. Just like how he would have to get up and tell people who've just died under his command where he would have to write a letter to all the families while keeping his emotions at bay. 
that was something he learned to do quite well. Then um, I got her dressed. She thought she was leaving. And then as we were walking out, uh, I struck her on the back of the head. Well, um, what did the hit on the back of the head do? Well, I was surprised that uh, her, her skull gave way. She was there and immediately unconscious. And I strangled her. Okay. What did you hit her with? Flashlight. Okay. In the house or outside the house? In the house. In the main portion, just in front of the fireplace. What do you mean the fine sign of it? Oh, it was kind of a blood I hadn't expected. I expected to knock her out, but obviously mm -hmm. generated a lot of blood. What did she bleed onto? The floor. It's just a tile floor. Okay. Did you clean it up or did you? I, I wiped it up. So when that happened, was she, did she have clothes on or was she naked? Yeah, she was dressed. Okay. So when we find her, is she going to have those clothes on too? Yeah. Can you tell me why you killed her? Right. Do you know why you killed her? Well, I think I killed her because I knew that uh, her story would be recognized. Her story would be recognized? How do you mean? Well, because she knew I was taking pictures. Although Williams' responses are shocking and Smith is clearly disturbed by them, he continued to remain composed, understanding, patient and non-demeaning. Marie France uh, Como. There was an open window in the basement of her uh, her house when she was away. I went in there uh, a couple of nights before uh, she came home. I went back in there uh, late at night when she was at home. I was on the phone in her bedroom. She actually discovered me in the basement. She was trying to get her cat to come upstairs and the cat was in the basement and seen me and was fixated on me in the corner. Couldn't get the cat up, so uh, she came down there, cut the light on. She came downstairs trying to get the cat, and uh, I'm not more sure why she uh, came over to me. I guess the cat was staring at me, and she was wondering what the cat was staring at. So when she spotted me, I uh, hit her with the same flashlight. I subdued her, tied her up, brought her upstairs, strangled her, well, or suffocated her. Tape. How do you subdue her? When you say subdue her in the basement, what do you do? What does that mean? Well, I had the same flashlight. She she saw me right away, so I just uh, hit her a couple of times and around her head, trying to knock her out. All right, y'all, I can just do that real quick. About to pause the video. I'll be right back. I'll be back. One second. All right, we back. Some uh, W DoorDash. Well, I had the same flashlight. She she saw me right away, so I just uh, hit her a couple of times and around her head, trying to knock her out. Did, but um, she was bleeding a little bit. Eventually, um, drew a struggle with some tutor. Did she recognize you? No, I had uh, stuff on my face. So then you go upstairs. And you said uh, she suffocated? Well, I suffocated her. I put tape on her. Uh, I put tape on her mouth. And then I put tape on her uh, nose and held it there so she couldn't breathe. Um, did she ever recognize you through this whole episode? Mm -hmm. What did you say you had on your face? I had just said uh, a cover for my head. Just, uh, you know, sports. Pull over to like just a little cap kind of thing. Okay. Just a just a headband over my nose and mouth. Did you take anything out of uh, Marie Francis' house or Jessica Lloyd's house? Uh, yeah, some of their uh, underwear. Okay. How much underwear is in those boxes? Um, uh, probably sixty pieces or so. Total. So you took sixty pieces from between the two of them. Yeah. So any of the underwear in those boxes belong to anyone other than Marie France or uh, or Jessica? 
Yeah, there's some from each of the other two women. Okay. So the first, uh, the first one, mm -hmm. I had just spotted her and got into the house while she was uh, asleep. Notice that she was alone. Just hit her with my hand while she was sleeping. Subdued her, mostly just by weight. Some pictures, took some of her underwear and left. And the other woman? Same kind of deal. Went through the back of the house. She was sleeping in her, um, not in her bedroom, but in her you know, front of the TV. Very much the same story. With uh, Laurie Masakai. What uh, the fuck is this nigga doing? The 76 Cozy Cove. How well, I was thinking in a corner. Decided on her. I knew she lived alone. Bro, he's in the I corner. She lived two years down and uh, didn't know her, but I knew she was pretty long. She had a boyfriend and hadn't seemed to be, had been around. So looked in the window and she was alone. She was asleep in front of the TV. We have been through this. Thing. I know. I struck her with the uh, flashlight. I knew it knocked her out, it didn't. We struggled. I subdued her. Took some pictures. Left. It's probably in the house about two and a half hours. What did you do with that? Uh, you said you took pictures of her. Um, clothed, unclothed? Uh, both. Clothed initially and then unclothed. Detective Jim Smith searched for Williams' motivation and it appears that he did not have any feelings at all to the women he raped and murdered. Williams said that he killed Jessica because he worried that her case would be tied to the two cases in Tweed. And for Marie Kumu, he killed her too because she was stationed at the same base in CFB Trenton. For Marie France Kumu, when she took her last breath, it was recorded on video. And for Jessica Lloyd, Williams bought her cooperation by promising if she did what he said, she would get her freedom. But after humiliating and raping her, recording it on video, Williams murdered her too. Let me ask you this, if, um, if this didn't come to the point it's at right now, if for whatever reason you didn't end up on our, on our radar, so to speak, would you confess? Uh, do you think it would have happened again? Oh. I was hoping not. I was hoping. Yeah, he definitely did. Why do you think these things happen? Oh. Have you spent much time thinking about that? About why? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know the answers. And I'm pretty sure the answers don't matter. They do matter. Let me ask you this. Did you like or dislike these women? I didn't know any of them. I had met Maddie Thomas that one time in, that, in our airplane. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And as always, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this and also the notification bell if you want to get an early notification of my next video. As Colonel Russell Williams pleaded guilty to two murders, two sexual assaults, and more than 80 break-ins, and many were described in detail. Along with each count came graphic photo evidence and a clear pattern to Williams' escalating crimes. You should be aware some of the facts are highly disturbing. Peter, the evidence presented in court today painted a chilling portrait of a predator who escalated from break and enters to sexual assault to murder, giving the public its first real glimpse of Russell Williams' criminal mind. Hours before Russell Williams arrived, police were here. No photo equipment. So were the media, lining up to get inside to tell what would be a bizarre, twisted story. It's the most graphic insight into Williams' double life, and it started soon after Williams shuffled into the courtroom, shackled and pale. In a voice that was at times barely audible, Williams pled guilty to all 88 charges against him. Then, slumped in his chair, his eyes downcast, he listened expressionless, while the Crown exhaustively recounted the case against him. Lloyd's family is bracing for a devastating week. Just hearing the stuff he did that doesn't even involve my sister makes me just as a Canadian angry. 
Throughout the proceedings, there were audible gasps, sometimes moans from people in the courtroom as one photograph after another was displayed on two large monitors in the courtroom. Tomorrow, Peter promises to be even more disturbing as lawyers lay out the evidence and the details of the two murders. You know, Ioana, um, he pled guilty. Uh, we know what the sentence is going to be. Why is the court going through all this? Why are we hearing the things we're hearing, seeing the things we're seeing in such detail? It is, it would seem on the surface to be an open and shut case, Peter, but lawyers and the Crown especially, and police too, wanted to lay out to the public the scope and the extent of their investigation, the sheer number of crimes, the horrific nature of the crimes, and especially to satiate the public's interest in such a public figure. <sighs> Amen. I mean, video. Hey, I made an hour long video in a minute. You know what I'm saying? Actually, I think now, now what I'm going to do is instead of doing parts, I'm going to just put all my videos in one. You know what I'm saying? So when you watch the video, you're not going to have to go back and find another part. You know what I'm saying? You can just watch it all in one. That's what I'm going to start doing. I feel like that's the best thing to do. You know what I'm saying? Because you find another part, you might not find it, might not probably be recommended or whatever. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so, I'm just a part of putting all of them in different videos. You know what I'm saying? You might see me in a different shirt or whatever because it's another day I'm doing it. You know what I'm saying? But it's all going to be in one video. But hey, y'all like, comment, subscribe. Comment, show me, react to next, man. Follow me on Instagram. That's where I'm most active at. Be on the grind of 10K, man. I'm out.